end of chapter 7, the evil uh, Haman was hanging on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Uh, the tables have been turned, not by uh, human um, activity ultimately, but by uh, the intervention of God using Esther, his servant, um, to make uh, Ahasuerus aware of the danger and then Ahasuerus becoming the Lord's instrument by which Haman um, was put to death. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite and the plot uh, that he had devised against the Jews. When the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose and stood before the king and she said, if it please the king, and if I have found favour in his sight, and if the thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows, because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. But you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king, and seal it with the king's ring. For an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. The king's scribes were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of, of Sivan, on the 23rd day. And an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews. The satraps, the governors, the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia. 127 provinces to each province in its own script and to each people in its own language and also to the Jews in their script and their language and he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring then he sent the letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service bred from the royal stud saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods. On one day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, copy of what was written was to be issued as a decree in every province, being publicly displayed to all peoples, and the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies. So the couriers mounted on their swift horses that were used in the king's service, rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white, with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honour, and in every province and in every city 
wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holy day. And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. And I want to turn back and read a few verses from Genesis chapter 12. The opening uh, f three uh, verses, uh, Genesis chapter 12, page 10, if you're using uh, the church Bible. And here's um, an important framework in which we interpret the events of um, Esther chapter 8. The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your own country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Note those words, and him who dishonours you or opposes you, I will curse, or I will fight against, the Lord says. Well, we turn this evening to Esther uh, chapter 8, and we have one, maybe two more studies to do, I'm not absolutely sure yet. Uh, in Esther after uh, tonight and of course uh, the tide has turned uh, against Haman and his evil plot and in favour of Esther, Mordecai and the Jews and just as the tide in the sea and the tide of the waters of the earth don't turn by themselves or by a mere fluke, but are turned by the hand of God, who set the moon and the times and the seasons. So this whole situation that is now turning is being turned by the hand of the unseen God in the book of Esther. Two weeks ago, our theme was, Whose is the Judgment? As we saw um, uh, and followed the fall of evil Haman. Uh, not at the hands of Ahasuerus, uh, ultimately, but at the hand of God. Because he had opposed, as we read in Genesis chapter 12, of the seed of Abraham. Death for him means life for Esther. However, all is not yet secure. All is not yet safe. Evil Haman's evil plot, and those are deliberate words, evil Haman's evil plot against the Lord's people, the Jews, still stands. And if everything is allowed to continue, as Haman had um, arranged uh, while he was prime minister, then in the twelfth month the Jews will be destroyed and annihilated. The hope of Messiah will be dead. This policy of uh, Haman's has been written into Persian law, uh, which cannot be changed. It ultimately is a policy of ethnic cleansing of the Jewish race. Not a single Jew will escape. Rich, poor, young, old, educated, uneducated, the ones living in the capital of Babylon, sorry, of Persia and Susa, and those away back home at the other end of the empire, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, Palestine all equally will be tracked down and they will be put to death. 
and all the promises of the Lord over 15 centuries um, will come to nothing. Messiah will not come. The salvation God has planned in eternity for Jew and Gentile in the Messiah will be an unfulfilled dream. And God will be robbed of his glory in the salvation of sinners. Evil will have triumphed. Now Esther could um, forgivably have breathed a sigh of relief at this stage. That for the time being, in any case, her life is safe. And she probably will survive any uh, genocide of the Jews because she's now in the palace. And she's the king's favourite wife. As long as she keeps on the right side of him. And does as he wants her to do. And Esther could have sat back. And she could have taken the attitude. I'm the queen. I'm going to enjoy life. I've got lots of luxury. I'm protected. Uncle Mordecai is now with me. He's the one that I care about most. End of story. But thankfully, and mercifully, and wonderfully, she doesn't take that attitude. Otherwise, we would not be here tonight. If she'd taken that attitude, there would be no salvation. We would have had no hope of being saved, no way to be saved, no good news of salvation. There'd be no bus, Hope 153, no church to proclaim salvation. However, instead of sitting back and doing nothing, Esther knows she has to act. She has to act. She has to keep going. She has to plead with the king for the lives of the Jews. The evil one, Haman, may have been defeated once for all, but his evil plot is alive. And how relevant this is to us today. Um, the Jews were spared. Christ has come. The gospel is being proclaimed. A multitude no man can number will be assembled in Christ on the day he returns. What an encouragement. But then here's the challenge. All believers, I, you, we are to be Esther's, active, engaged against the plot of the evil one. And when I wrote this sermon, I wasn't sure what I was preaching on in the morning. And you'll see there are overlaps. Christ has conquered the evil one, Satan. But Satan's evil plot against the human race still stands. His intention, if he were to have his way, is to take every last human being to hell with him. That hasn't changed. That's still his intention. And what are we going to, to do? How are we going to act? to thwart this evil plot. Are we Esther's? Are we concerned for the fellow salvation of our fellow countrymen like Paul was in our call to worship? Are we concerned for our family? Are we concerned for our neighbors? There are three things we want to learn tonight as we look at this passage and we see deliverance from evil. And the question is, Whose is the deliverance? There's three things we want to note about this deliverance. First of all, deliverance needed. Deliverance needed. Evil Haman, verse 1, was the enemy of the Jews. Make no mistake, scripture is clear. It talks about enemies and friends. It doesn't talk about everyone being alike. And in God's sight tonight, 
There are the friends of God and there are the enemies of God. The friends of God are those who are in Christ, saved from their sin. The enemies of God are those who by nature belong to the devil. And he is their father. And with Satan they are opposed to God and his righteousness. However benignly or quietly that opposition may be. When push comes to shove, the unbeliever will act like an unbeliever and the enemy of God. Mordecai's life has been delivered. But verse 3, the evil plot of Haman, the scheme he has devised against the Jews. Remember Genesis 12. Anyone who opposes you, Abraham, and seeks to destroy you. Well, that's what Haman was doing. He was seeking to destroy those that God had put uh, his purpose around and his plan into, into action through. And anyone uh, who, uh, this evil plan still remains on the statute books of Persia. Notice again, Esther goes to the king. It's the same day, probably, almost certainly. And notice again how she doesn't say, well, I'm God's child. I can breeze in here and I can be whatever I want to be and speak whatever way I want to speak. And this king owes it to me. Do some Christians behave like that? Boy, I'm a Christian. And they storm in to work and they bang the table and take notice of who I am and they, they make all kinds of demands and it's, it's crazy it's crazy, futile notice how Esther approaches this ungodly, unsaved king but he's the most powerful man in the world, far more powerful than um, any Russian leader or any uh, American leader of our day or any uh, British leader of the past or of any other empire this empire stretches, remember we saw from India right the way across to Palestine. And look at Esther. What does she do? She approaches him with reverence and humility. If it pleases the king, if I find acceptance in your sight, this this is attitude of petition. I'm a servant. You're the king. And what's more? I'm a servant of the king of kings. Some Christians think they are the king, Christ. And they act and they speak as if they are the king. They forget they're the servants of the king. And it behooves us who are servants of the king to act with humility always. And... Um, with tentativity, we don't know what ultimately God's, how God's going to work. He may not work through us. And so we've got to be tentative, we've, tentative, we've got to be reverent, we've got to be humble as we approach those who have authority over us. That means a boss at work. That means the government. That means a policeman. That means those who've been given authority and authority that ultimately derives itself from God and to whom they are responsible for the exercise of it. But notice also, not just her reverence and humility, vital though that is, look at her passion and compassion for her own people. Verse 3, she implored him with tears. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, as Paul wrote, is that she may be saved. And here Esther is imploring with tears that Ahasuerus will counter act uh, the evil plot. Verse 6, for how can I endure to see this evil come to my people? Deliverance needed. And deliverance, we could say, is being pleaded here. Being pleaded. And brethren, since the fall of man, and Genesis uh, uh, 
chapter 3, Satan holds the entire human race by nature captive to him. And uh, though he has been defeated, let's not forget that, at Calvary, he was defeated once and for all. Men and women and young people are his servants by nature, duped and deceived and, um, and uh, in bondage to him and they need to be delivered from him. And you and I, who believe in Christ tonight, we have a king. A king. He's very different from Ahasuerus. He's a good king. He's a glorious king. He's a universal king. And he is a kingdom that's extending throughout the world. And he loves his bride. The elect. And he delights to give good gifts to them when they ask and pray. And brethren, are we Esther's before the king? Are we Esther's before King Jesus? Coming in humble humility, coming in reverence, coming with passion and compassion for the lost in our families, among our friends, in our community, in our nations. And any here tonight, we cannot say, I am in Christ. I am a new creation. The old things have passed away. All things in my life have been made new. If you can't say that tonight, then you need deliverance. You need deliverance from your sin and from your um, uh, death, not just, not we're talking about physical death here, but we're talking about spiritual and eternal death in hell. And you need to be delivered from Satan because he is intent on taking you to hell. Yes, he takes good people in the world's eyes. Nice people in the world's eyes. Church going people in the world's eyes. Bible reading people. But you see, all that they've all this in common, they're not in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you tonight need to go before King Jesus and plead your cause with him. Because he is the one who delights to give good gifts, to give salvation to those who humble themselves and call upon his name. Whoever calls upon his name in the light of their sin shall be saved. Deliverance needed. But then let's notice secondly tonight, deliverance devised. Deliverance devised. And we're looking now at verses 7 to 14. Or you could have it, deliverance planned, if that's easier to remember. King Ahasuerus, if there's one thing we've learned about this man, well, there's many things we've learned about him. But here's one thing that stands out to me again and again. He wants an easy life. Go away. Do whatever you want to do. As long as you don't compromise me, as long as you don't bother me, as long as I can get on with who I am and enjoy what I have, go away and get on with it. You can have whatever you want. And so, King Ahasuerus, what does he do here? He doesn't give any help to his bride, Esther. He doesn't bend a finger. He doesn't um, dot an I or cross a T in the deliverance of the Jews. He, he as it were, almost um, like um, a father who wants to get a son um, out of his presence to get on with something else, he throws his ring like 20 quid down on the table. And he says, away you go. Get on with it. 
And so it's left to Mordecai, his prime minister, left to Esther, his wife, uh, sorry, the bride, to um, devise a way of overcoming this evil plan. And actually, this is a really good thing. Because bear in mind who Esther and Mordecai are. They have access to what we saw this morning, that heavenly wisdom. And surely we see this heavenly wisdom playing itself out here. And brethren, if in our workplaces, in our homes, in our families, there's a major issue and we bring it to someone and they say, okay, you take it on and solve it. Don't do it in your own strength. Do not do it in your own strength. Don't say, oh, I'm very important. I've been given this job. Get down on your knees and pray, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom to diffuse this situation, to change it. And uh, because the reality is Mordecai and <coughs> Esther have this situation, there's a law that has been passed and it cannot be changed. The Jews will be annihilated on the... Uh, on, on the twelfth month, that can't be revoked. So how do you get around that? When the wisdom of God, they come up with an alternative law, which now enables the Jews to assemble together, so they're not like sheep being led to the slaughter, they're now gathered together, they can gather together in their cities, and they can defend themselves, and they can actually take up arms to protect themselves. How wise. And you see here, many of the things that are actually precious in our society, which are actually under threat, and they will be lost. Freedom of assembly will be lost in our land. Freedom of expression will be lost in our land. You can't have those things without a fear of God. And our, our country will stumble more and more to be like uh, what we would have called the dictatorships of the world. It's a dictatorship not of one man, like the Russian president, what is the dictatorship of the majority who don't believe. And that is every bit as tyrannical and destructive to the freedom and the liberties of the Church of Christ and of people generally as power concentrated in the hands of one man. You see, when we fail to recognize that all power belongs to God, we've started on the slippery slope of man seizing power. And those who oppose him and his ideas become destroyed. And so um, there's a freedom to, they get this freedom to assemble, they get this right to defend themselves, they get the right to self-determination. So many crucial things. The wisdom of God working through Mordecai and Esther, and then with the help of these legal people, you put it into the legal ease. Here's what we want. And so the advisors write it all down, and then it goes out, and it's the equivalent of going out by first class meal. Priority post. So that it arrives quickly throughout the empire, so that the Jewish people have time to plan. Because if they're going to defend themselves, you don't just turn up in the morning. And defend yourself. Football team doesn't just turn up next Saturday. What's that team? Newcastle United. They don't just turn up on Saturday and defend their last match, their record. They have practiced during the weekend. They have trained during the weekend. They have put together a plan during the week. And so the Jews need as much time as possible. God's people, when we are, our backs are against the wall, we should grab as much time as possible to find a way of deliverance and then to bring that deliverance to pass. Deliverance devised. But brethren, let's see the great contrast here. King Ahasuerus, you remember we said, left his bride to do it? Didn't bend a finger? What about King Jesus? See something in heaven tonight saying, 
I don't care. I'm not bothered. I'm, my body is free from uh, all the, the pressures of living in a fallen world as I had to do for 30 years, 30 plus years. I'm in heaven. Get out of it. Is that what Christ says? No. What a gracious king. What a kind king. What are we told in Hebrews? He is made of our flesh and bone. And he's a sympathetic and faithful high priest. One who understands us. One who comes alongside his people. One who helps his people. He never throws a signet ring or 20 quid on the table and says, get on with it. He doesn't throw us the Bible on the table and say, get on with it. No, he is our shepherd. He goes before us. He goes with us. He gives us wisdom. He gives us strength. He gives us grace. And whatever... Whatever um, prison, as we sang in the first psalm tonight, whatever a cave we're hemmed into, if we're believers, we're not in it alone. We're like Daniel in the lion's den. You remember what happened? The Lord shut the lion's mouth. The Lord was with them. We're like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. A fourth appeared in the form of man. Christ is with his people in their troubles, individually, in families, and in the church. And how different and how glorious our king is. He, he plans the deliverance. He reveals to us the deliverance. Not only the deliverance from sin at Calvary, but also the way of deliverance out of our troubles. Is that not right? Have you not experienced that? There's been times in your Christian life where you've looked and you said, I don't know where I'm going to turn. I don't know what I'm going to do next. I have no idea how to go forward. And perhaps for a moment there's been uh, a wave of despair that has just swept over you like the wave in the sea when you're in swimming. But then you get your head up again. You say, no, no, I'm not in this way. My Savior, he leads me in paths of righteousness. He leads us out of the dark places and the difficult places. And that's what happens here. Deliverance is devised. Uh, and it's devised uh, uh, by Esther and Mordecai in dependence upon the Lord God as king, not an earthly king. And so, even when the law is devised and sent out, is that the end of it? Is everything sealed there? No. The Jews in every city, it, this law, it is so weak. If the Lord God doesn't strengthen it, if the Lord doesn't surround them like a fortress, the Jews in every place, on the day when they will be attacked. If the Lord doesn't give them strength. To wield the, the, the shield and the sword. The shield to protect themselves. And the sword to uh, attack when they need to attack. Then the law itself is hopeless. And so again even as it goes out this law. Which is full of wisdom. It is no power except the power that God puts into it. At the end of the day. This is still, it's, it's a David and Goliath scenario all over again. A little group of Jews against this massive sea of Philistines, unbelievers. And David succeeded against Goliath and the Philistines in and through his trust in the Lord despite his own weakness. And you see, deliverance is not only planned. Uh, the deliverance at Calvary and the deliverance for our individual lives is not only planned by the Lord. 
gets executed by him. It gets feet and strength and hands and power from him. And so, brethren, whatever situation you're in, personal, family, work situation, and you're working through some difficulty and you need wisdom, ask for that wisdom. But don't just ask for wisdom, ask then for strength from the Lord to see the plan implemented, the plan coming to fruition. And that's the secret of, of the daily Christian life. Whether we're in trouble or not in trouble, thank God there's many days of our lives that are relatively trouble-free compared to what other people have to experience. But even in those trouble-free days as well, we need to look to the Lord. We need to look up because our help comes from above, not from within. Not from the latest guru or the latest ideas on the internet or wherever people turn to. Deliverance needed, deliverance devised, and let's see thirdly and more briefly, deliverance celebrated. Deliverance celebrated. Verses 15 to 17. These are truly remarkable verses, aren't they? Because this is even before, notice when this celebration is happening. This is happening at the end of the third month they're not going to know whether they've succeeded or not for nine months until nine months pass so why are they celebrating they're celebrating because they know that God will do what he purposes and so how wonderful in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of the threat of death hanging over their lives, these people celebrate because they see God at work and they know that God will accomplish his purpose for them. And God's purpose is that the Jews will continue until the Christ comes. They know that. And so um, it brings this outburst of joy um, and um, we don't see any complaint here we don't see fear rising to the surface we don't hear of people being anxious we don't um, um, uh, see them uh, responding uh, with unbelief no they respond with faith and you see faith gives hope and hope expresses itself in joy Isn't that wonderful faith gives us hope not in ourselves not in other people but faith in Christ gives us hope not just I hope that tomorrow but it gives hope there means assurance it gives us certainty and when you have certainty you have joy and that's what happens here. And we see it in verses 16 and verses 17. The Jews had light and gladness, joy and honour. Um, and um, so there, there's what's happening amongst them. But also look at the other result that it brought forth. There's, there is, pardon me, something happening out there in the world as well. Look at verse 15. Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in this capital city. He's dressed in royal apparel. He's dressed now as the most important man after the king. Fine linen and purple. And what did the city of Shushan say? Oh no. We hate that man. Let's get rid of him. The Satan of the city of Shushan rejoiced in his land. Proverbs 11, verse 11. The rejoicing that happens in a nation among a people when it is the righteous who are in places of government. 
And strikingly, when Haman was made prime minister, there was no rejoicing in Shushan. And I think by the silence, there's an implication in that, that um, there was no joy because he was an evil man. But here, this man, Mordecai, has been seen, he's been watched by others. They know of him, they've seen him at the city gate. They have seen he's a man of principle. They know that he will do right. And there's joy amongst the ungodly. But there's not just joy. Look at what happens. Verse 17. In every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. We've mentioned that already. Then many of the people of the land, many unbelievers... Many non-Jews became Jews. They put faith in the God of Israel, the God of salvation, the God of deliverance. And so the words of uh, Esther 4 and 14 uh, are fulfilled. Do you remember Esther was told, if you remain silent, at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And deliverance has come and does come through Esther and her father's house. And it's celebrated here. And so, brethren, deliverance celebrated. You and I as Christians, we're to be filled with faith at all times, hope in all circumstances. No matter how bad things are, we have the assurance that uh, Christ has forgiven us our sins, that we are going to heaven. And whatever happens, we are safe in the hands of Christ. So there should be faith and there should be hope and that will bring joy. That will express itself in joy. And people will say to you, I look at your life and you're experiencing this and this and this and yet, they'll put it like this, you're always cheerful. And you, that's your opportunity to say, I am. Because I have faith in Christ the Deliverer. I have hope in Him. And He gives me joy. Whose is the deliverance? The deliverance is by the Lord and from the Lord for you and me. For you are not Christians tonight. Salvation is offered to you in Christ. He says, come, repent of your sin, believe, be saved. And having delivered you from your sin, and my, me from my sin, it's a simple thing for him to deliver us from anything else and everything.